Great. So I we will we will just go ahead and get started here. Um, we have a very full hour, so I want to give as much time for the you know all, all the time we need for the presentation. So so we are going to get just get started here. So first of all, welcome everyone to the Repicture STEM Career Accelerator student final presentations. We are going to put a link here in the chat for the program for today's event. Uh, if you have trouble accessing that document, um, let us know. I think we have emailed it to everyone on this list. It was included in the, the invite, uh, the meeting invite for today. Um, but we've heard that some people are having trouble accessing that, but not everyone, so we can figure out why. Um, so yes, and, and, and you can always follow up after the meeting today and we'll share that with you. So on behalf of the whole Repicture summer team, I would like to welcome you to the final event of our six week STEM Career Accelerator. I'm Elisa and I'm one of the co-founders of Repicture along with Lynn Neo. Um, we are very blessed to have Jerry Norman as a returning peer mentor this year and our panel moderator for the summer as well as Jody Russell, our returning director of student success, who was also with us last year, as well as four amazing peer mentors, uh, Jim Song, Asai Moreno, Lindsay Tatsumi, and Michael Fisher Hagens. Uh, together, this team and a few others working behind the scene uh, has made our, our summer a success. So today, I, pr I promise we will get into the presentations. I know you are all here to see very soon. Um, to give you all some context for the wonderful presentations you are all about to hear, um, I want to start by telling you a little bit about us and our Career Accelerator so you have some context uh, going into those presentations. Um, and then we're going to recognize all of the award winners for our contest this summer. Um, and finally, I'll go over a little bit of info and logistics for the breakout rooms, um, introduce our judges, and then we'll move into those breakout rooms uh, to see the student presentations. So I actually wanna kick off today by sharing the exciting news that this program that you are all now a part of is also now an award-winning program. Uh, we are this year's winner of the Women in Engineering Proactive Network Break Breakthrough Award, joining past winners that include companies like IBM and AT&T. So we are thrilled for this recognition of us and our mission to help students uh, succeed in STEM. So although there are so many people that helped make this summer uh, possible, I want to give a special shout out to two people who really help get this summer's program started. Um, Jody, who uh, really helped get us out there and sharing with our community our story and uh, what we're doing. And Natalie, who is instrumental in introduce introducing us to Ashraf and helping to form our relationship with CSI, who is our, our lead sponsor for the summer. So we wanna thank CSI, uh, Computers and Structures, for making this summer's program possible and enabling us to offer it free to so many students uh, from underrepresented backgrounds and to our partner organizations. Um, we also wanna give a special thank you to the National Education Equity Lab. I know a few of you are here today. Um, one, uh, they, they were a key, key partner in helping make our 2022 program possible as well. And we were lucky to have several other students again this year, including one that you will hear from today. I would also like to thank Mose, who has been instrumental in helping connect our students with some incredible speakers this year. Um, Mose is a great supporter of youth and of uplifting the next generation, and he helped introduce our students to uh, Taj Eldridge on the topic of climate change, Jessica Burnett on digital health, uh, Neve Donnelly and Hushin Sabag on robotics, um, Michelle Sika, who brought semiconductors to life for us, and Matthew Graysick on, uh, on aviation. So some of them are here today. Um, so welcome back and we hope you enjoy meeting some of the students that you helped inspire this summer. So many of you who are here today know a lot about Repicture uh, and some of you are new to Repicture. So I wanna share briefly with you about uh, Repicture and about our very special and unique and growing community. 
Um, so Repicture is a project-based community platform where students learn about people and organizations in the STEM world through uh, actual real world projects that are having a meaningful impact in the world all around us. And um, so once they discover a project, they actively learn about it um, from through the people and the organizations behind it. Um, and in the process, they grow their STEM networks, make connections, and, uh, and shape their future in STEM. Our growing STEM community is the reason our program has been so successful these past few years. And we're so proud to say that we've now had over 400 profiles created. I think it might be more like 500 now. Um, we, we've worked with over 80 STEM mentors. Again, that, that might also be an underestimate uh, by now, um, who have helped to provide over 250 hours of coaching to our students. Um, and we've also been able to work with students from so many different backgrounds, including this year's amazing group of STEM, future STEM leaders. Um, and because you've taken the time to join us here today, you're helping to make this community even stronger. So to give you a, a little sense of what we've done this summer, this is our calendar events. Repicture, uh, the Repicture STEM Career Accelerator is our flagship program where students are provided with one-on-one -on -one career coaching, mentorship, professional skills building, and the tools to create a personal portfolio of project research that will help them unlock opportunities and thrive in the world of STEM. So for the past six weeks, uh, students have attended workshops while exploring different STEM careers. Um, each week they've completed assignments related to the skills we worked on that week, and they enter their work, they've entered their work into contests. Their presentations today are part of the last assignment of the summer. Today's our last day. Um, they are uh, giving five minute presentations on a STEM project that they uh, chose and researched and published and added to their repicture portfolios this summer. And with that, we're going to actually turn over to our awards ceremony. So yes, as I mentioned earlier, each week we had con we have contests, and we had a ton of fantastic entries. Um, it was often very hard to pick the winners. I would like to present the winners though of our 2022 program contests, and um, I'll I'll go through everyone pretty quickly today. But I encourage you all to go to a picture and learn more about these amazing students and the projects they they uh, researched uh, this summer. So they've really done an incredible job and their projects are very interesting. Um, one thing, very special thing you will find on Repicture is what the students have done is they've taken sometimes these very complex projects. Um, you know, STEM professionals don't always take the time to explain what, what they do to the to the greater world. And, and they've really translated that and, and they're helping to tell the story of STEM in a way that, really anybody can understand. So I uh, definitely encourage you to check them out. Uh, and with that, we'll uh, go through the winners. So best written profile, we have Joshua, Guadalupe, and Madeline. For most inspirational profile, Julian, Jasmine, and Pranil. Best project you worked on, Julian, Avaril, and Brenda. Best written reflections on a project you worked on, Pranil, Avaril, and Brenda. Best interest project from an ambassador, one of our returning students, Hannah. Best interest project, Amber, Chloe, uh, Catherine, and Joshua. Best written reflections on an interest project, Shunita, Catherine, Joshua. Best climate resilience project, Akib, Best Digital Health Project, Avaril. Best Robotics Project, Srinitha. Best Aviation Project and People's Choice for our week three, uh, Brenda. Best Project in an other category, Julian. Best Team Project in week three, Neha, Jasmine, and Melissa. Best Overall Project in week three, Anna. Best project based on an interview with a STEM professional, 
Amber, Chloe, and Kuzi. People's Choice for week four, Julian. And finally, we have our best team project in week five, Jasmine, Neha, Aaron, and Melissa. And you'll be hearing from this team actually today. So congratulations again to all of our winners this year. They've done an amazing job. And again, I'm really encouraged to go and check out their profiles on the fiction. So congratulations. And finally, I want to recognize all of the students that participated in the program this year. Um, we again, for the third summer, had participants from all over the US and the world. Um, so we'll drop a link in the chat to, actually we have a 2022 program page and where you can find all of our students and learn more about them and the projects that they, they, they worked on this summer. Um, and you all can be part of that project page as well, the 2022 page. Um, everyone that provides feedback to our students today will be added to that page as program mentors. So we will always be connected um, by coming together here today. And now what we've all been waiting for, we are going to move on to the presentations. Um, I'll go over just a few logistics first and welcome our judges. Um, so the, to give you a little bit of background, the students have chosen their STEM projects um, and they've researched, uh, like I mentioned earlier, and published articles about them on Repicture. So after today, you'll be able to read more about their project and, as well as watch their present presentations again on their Repicture project page, um, including those uh, presentations and those students that actually chose to do their final presentation uh, with a video instead of presenting live today. Um, today, our, uh, our students are also competing for our final contest of the year, best live presentation. And uh, presentations will be about five minutes, uh, plus or minus a little bit, uh, and then eight minutes for teams. After that, we'll have a few minutes of Q&A. Questions are highly encouraged. Our students love to hear your questions, and we have some very interesting topics today, so I'm sure you will have lots of questions for them. Um, during that time, you will also have an opportunity to provide feedback. Um, feedback is also very welcome. The students uh, really get a lot out of that feedback. Um, so we'll, we'll give a link to the feedback forms uh, in the breakout rooms. And uh, you can also find a link to those, those feedback forms in the uh, in the program for today that we shared with you earlier in this presentation. So today's student presentations will be judged on visuals, stage presence, and clarity of presentation. And you'll see all of that in the feedback form itself. Um, you can also, if you'd like, uh, just email us your feedback. Um, you don't have to use the form if you're not able to um, access it for whatever reason. Um, or use it with the device that you're on, um, you can always just email us our, your feedback as well. And last but certainly not least, before we go into the breakout rooms, I want to welcome our judges today. Thank you so much for supporting our students. We will introduce all of you just a moment when we go into our breakout rooms. And with that, Asai has assigned us all to breakout rooms. So we'll move over there now. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us for today. Um, we really look forward to sharing your feedback with the students and to following up after today to let you know who the winners are of our final contest. So bye for now, everyone, and see some of you in just a moment. OK, good. Um, my name is Jody Russell, and I'll be the moderator for this group of student presentations. I also want to um, introduce Lindsay. Lindsay is helping with all the logistics. There she is waving. And I'd like to introduce and really extend a big thank you to our judges. So we have Dave Zolet. He is, want to wave hi, Dave? Where's your, there you go. He's an internal medicine physician. Gary Perlman was a military attorney concentrating on medical malpractice and environmental law. 
Jerry Norman, where's Jerry? Jerry is a returning peer mentor for last summer, and she has just launched her career in the last few months as a transportation planner. And so the judges will be scoring the student presentations to determine the contest winner for best live presentation. Uh, if anyone else in the audience, I think you heard this already, if you wanna provide feedback, uh, there's a link that Lindsay provided in the chat. Um, and again, a review, each student will give a five minute presentation. We do in this particular breakout room have one group presentation. Um, and then following the presentations, we'll have a couple of minutes to ask questions. Um, in order to ask a question, just unmute yourself or you can stick your question in the chat, but it makes it so much easier when you just unmute yourself. Um, with that, we wanna get started with our student presentations. First up is Angelina. Angelina is a repicture ambassador um, and returning student from last summer's program. She, wait till you hear this presentation. She recently graduated high school, is interested in neuroscience and believes that neuroscience will contribute to society in many great ways. So with that, we uh, welcome Angelina. Thank you for the introduction, and I will start sharing my presentation. Um, it says that the host disabled participant screen sharing. Lindsay, are you um, able to respond to that? Oh, it's, there it is, okay. Okay, hi, my name is Angelina Leopardo, and for my presentation, I did a new era in psilocybin research. So I'm going to start with a brief history. So humans have, have used psilocybin, also known as magic mushrooms for over 12,000 years, most commonly in religious ceremonies. And the cultures that most commonly used psilocybin were the Aztecs and Mayans. But when these cultures were colonized by the Spanish, mushrooms and also the ceremonies were outlawed completely because they were considered satanic practice against the Catholic Church. So going forward several hundred years, thousands of psilocybin studies took place between the 1950s and 70s. It was considered a breakthrough in understanding the human mind and psychology. But unfortunately, psilocybin was then federally outlawed in 1968 and placed under Schedule I, which is drugs that have currently no medical use. And this happened because of Nixon's war on drugs where he outlawed other substances such as marijuana and LSD. And of course, research abruptly discontinued. So what is psilocybin and how does it affect your brain? Psilocybin is the naturally occurring hallucinogenic chemical found in certain types of mushrooms. It affects mood, perception, and cognition, which is the frontal lobe, and it has also been found to affect memory retention. So it affects the frontal lobe and also the amygdala, which is memory. And it works by increasing connections in different regions in the brain and also affects the serotonin 2A, 5-HT2A receptors. When ingested, psilocybin turns into the active chemical psilocin and binds to these receptors, increasing serotonin. And right here, this image is the serotonin receptor. So of course, there is stigma around psilocybin. This is partially due to the government scheduling, making it very difficult to get psilocybin for research. But to compare it to a legal, more culturally accepted drug, 0.2% um, of mushroom users seek emergency care, which can be compared to alcohol, which has an estimated 95,000 yearly mortality rate. And of course, there is a cultural stigma as well. Um, because of Nixon's war on drugs, there is a lack of education or knowledge in the general public and even in the medical community. And it's seen as dangerous and highly addictive. So since the late 90s, psilocybin has seen a second renaissance since the 50s in research. 
And it's been found to improve major depression, kind of disrupting the rigid, um, the rigid patterns most seen with depression, increasing brain flexibility, and also an increase by 10% in the number of neural connections. As I said before, it also increases serotonin in the brain, similar to an SSRI, also known as an antidepressant, which makes it very good for treating depression. So combining therapy and psych psychedelics is currently in phase three, which is clinical research. And if this is approved, it could be used along with therapy to improve the lives of those suffering from various mental illnesses. So in a clinical setting, the patient will lay down in a bed in a comfortable room designed specifically for a psilocybin session. They then would receive a dose of psilocybin in a capsule. And during this experience, the patient would listen to a specifically designed music playlist and wear an eye mask to help them focus internally and on the therapy session. And during this, which can last six to eight hours, a therapist will be in the room assisting. But of course, this we have to focus on the risks because psilocybin is still a psychoactive drug. So it's very important to be cautious and not to self-experiment because it could lead to adverse effects and actually make your condition worse if you have a bad experience. And all psilocybin therapy should be done with a medical professional in a controlled environment. And this image right here is what psilocybin therapy might look like in a clinical setting. So these were the sources I used. And if anyone has any questions, I will take them. Thank you for listening. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was the, was wonderful, Angelina. You. Um, Dave, you had a question? Sure. Yeah, so um, one quick question then a little bit longer one perhaps. The quick question was whether you had the opportunity to see any psilocybin um, interventions or therapy sessions during this, or is this all, um, the research that you've done, you know, paper-wise. In other words, I just was curious whether you would have the opportunity to see this in action. So I actually haven't seen it in action. I kind of did more like research papers, but there's certainly, you can find it online of recordings. Yeah. No, just yeah. curious. So a little bit longer question is that, you know, in, I'm in the Baltimore area. Johns Hopkins has been doing a lot of research in psilocybin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually know someone who underwent therapy for uh, smoking yeah, uh, and smoking cessation. And um, this is someone who smoked all of their, you know, 40 plus years. And um, um, the episode was actually incredibly successful. She, she couldn't tell us all of the intimate details, but, you know, three years out, she still has no interest in smoking. I was, my question is, you had mentioned the use of psilocybin for depression. I wonder how much information you saw about uh, addictions and other applications, because it seems to be an incredibly powerful tool. It may be useful in, in sub hallucinogenic doses, um, which might be safer. Yeah, exactly. So it is very effective for addiction. Many people, like you said, they don't feel the need to partake in the substance that they were addicted to. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um, and many people say that it's one of the most meaningful experiences of their entire life. So that's very interesting. Thank you. Okay, Gary, you had a question? Yeah, um, uh, my question is, uh, are you aware of uh, any, um, any activity towards removing the uh, prohibitions uh, that are presently in uh, federal law? Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, well, uh, I assume that the... Um, psilocybin is still on schedule one, yeah. uh, schedule one drug. And uh, I was wondering whether you are aware of any efforts to remove that uh, or otherwise to promote uh, further research um, 
from a federal government standpoint? Uh, yeah, there there's a lot of movements, um, especially recently. Uh, I know that, I don't know if anyone here has read it, but there's a book, How to Change Your Mind. And that definitely jump-started a lot of movement um, in the public as well and research movement, uh, especially after seeing the effects that psilocybin has positively on people, even if you're not struggling with uh, a mental illness or addiction. So yeah, there's definitely a very big movement right now, especially since it's in phase three, which is very close to government approval for um, therapeutic use. Okay, yeah. if somebody has um, a little tiny question to ask, we have about a minute uh, to spare. Um, I'll ask one. Okay. Okay. Um, Unrela well, slightly related, but um, what has been your most rewarding part of um, doing research on this um, topic? Well, the most rewarding part was kind of going more into my love uh, for neuroscience. Uh, this has kind of opened my eyes to a lot, a lot of different ways the human brain works. Um, and something that I didn't know before, of course, because as I said, there's a lot of cultural stigma around psilocybin, so no one really talks about it and uh, the impact it has on your brain. So yeah, just, I guess, gaining more knowledge was the most rewarding. Okay, uh, great. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Angelina, um, thank you for your um, really wonderful presentation and lots and lots of good luck to you. Thank you. Okay, so next we're going to go to Jasmine. I see her over there, little wave. Jasmine is a high school student pursuing a career in biology, a girl after my own heart. Jasmine wants to make an impact on future youth and wants you to know that she is extremely passionate, not only about STEM, but helping others reach their goals. So uh, with that, Jasmine, you're on. Hi, um, I'll share my screen now. Oh, give me a second. Okay, so I did my project on um, a research project on brain-derived exosomal proteins as effective biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. Um, Here's a brief table of contents that I'll be going over. Um, what is Alzheimer's disease, AD, um, about the project, the testing process, the results, and the future implications? Um, so one, what is Alzheimer's disease? Senile dementia, also known as Alzheimer's disease, AD, is a progressive neurological disorder that this slowly destroys and kills the brain connections and cells that affect a person's memory and other crucial mental functions. The disease affects over 50 million people worldwide and becomes more common at ages 65 and older. The cause of AD is currently unknown and there is no known cure for the disease. However, early diagnosis can lead to more opportunities for effective treatments. Two, about this project. Who made this happen? There were three science, scientists slash researchers that were involved in this project, Kai Young Kim, Ki Young Shin, and Kion A. Cheng. And some other information includes the location, which was in Korea, the funding by the Korean government, um, and the National Research Foundation Bio and Medical Development Program. The current project status is complete. Um, so down to the actual project itself. Um, so current factors to AD diagnosis is blood, saliva, cerebral spinal fluid, also known as CSF, um, structural MRI, and a PET. The key factors to the diagnosis is CSF, which is rarely performed by general practitioners due to the nature of the procedure. This is where the usage of blood analysis comes in. Blood analysis, a lab analysis found in blood and AD, has shown to be extremely promising in all aspects of um, AD testing. Additionally, blood collection is minimally invasive which is where we begin to discuss the use of blood biomarkers, a biological molecule that is found in blood and is a sign of regular and irregular process. Since blood biomarkers would prove to be um, a huge aid to early AD diagnosis. With all of this in mind, utilizing DDE proteins, extracellular nanovesicles released by all cell lineages of the central nervous system that are detected in the peripheral red, um, blood, this, pro this project proposes to evaluate those BD proteins in the peripheral blood as blood biomarkers for AD by administ 
administering standardized analysis with meta-analysis to discuss the future usage of BDE proteins as AD biomarkers. So some benefits to this project, um, beneficiaries to this project are victims of AD and their respective families and um, neurology researchers. Um, if victims of AD can discover the disease early on, it will lessen anxiety and victims can participate in clinical trials for treatments for Alzheimer's. The families of many victims, um, many, many victims to AD can also prepare for the financial and communal effects of AD with more early on cases for researchers to study conclusions to what causes the disease and more information on early AD and what can be done to prevent, uh, to potentially prevent AD can be discovered within these clinical trials. So the testing process, um, process results and the future implications. So the researchers first chose 20 articles of 342 to be used as eligible studies and previous works to look back on when studying their work. These studies showcased the BDE proteins for AD. Um, then researchers tested these BDE BD proteins from the articles for AD. And continuing this, um, thirdly, researchers tested the changes of <laughs> of exosomal proteins in AD. Continuing, researchers tested the proteins in AD and whether their levels increased, decreased, or remained the same. From this, researchers then chose six proteins to use in the meta-analysis. Here are all um, 10, or it might be more proteins, but about 10 from what I counted. The last test was using meta-analysis of duplicated BD proteins in AD, and six proteins were used to, um, for this final test. And here are the results from all six, and I'll explain furthermore in the next slide. So the results from all these tests from the six final proteins that were chosen from all previous tests have inconsistent re results, unfortunately, on whether they can be effective in AD diagnosis. However, four of the six have been suggested as potential effective biomarkers and would need more research and time to fully boot to fully be boot from um, the entire discussion. And the remaining two have also been suggested for consideration in future research, even though the results from um, those two weren't significant. Um, so future implications, while the results were inconclu inconclusive, it doesn't fully close the case on whether BDE proteins are effective and results will, um, for this will need more time and testing to get a clear cut answer on how they can be of use. Here are my citations and thank you. And if you have any questions, you can email, email me down below. Wonderful. Good for you, Jasmine. Um, do we have any questions? Sure. <laughs> Good. This is Good work, and, and um, you sound like you have a good handle on what meta-analyses are, this idea of pooling data from lots of smaller studies. Yeah, that was really interesting to learn about meta-analysis. Um, I, I didn't really realize, because um, I use meta-analysis in certain ways, but not as an actual lab science stuff like that. But I feel like I've used methods of, like similar to meta-analysis, which is really interesting to find out about. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's commonly done in clinical medicine because a lot of studies are relatively small, and so it's a way of increasing the power of of, of the studies by pooling the data. There's a lot of careful methodology that needs to be done to make sure these are compatible studies. What I wanted to ask you was, um, what what was your sense, your takeaway of all of this work being done, and yet the results being somewhat inconclusive. In other words, people are hoping for an easy blood test that would be very um, accurate in terms of predicting who and who, who will not develop Alzheimer's, but yet this, these, this study, particularly this meta-analysis came up with what most other studies have come up with, and that is right now it's inconclusive. I don't know what would, what was your sense of that? Where would you go with that? I, me personally, I was really upset when I read that part because they had put a lot of work into that. Like what you saw right now was a really, really condensed part of what the scientists did. Like they did about, I think, six kind of separate tests um, to, to just find everything inconclusive. It was really upsetting. Um, but I think it happens sometimes when you're testing for, for things like this, especially you're going to find some well, I wouldn't say bugs, but you're gonna find um, problems. And um, as I said, 
it was inconclusive. So there is there is still hope, and I'm holding hope because um, the four of the six um, had kind of significant results, but they needed more time for testing. So, so you've got this filter out what is useful and and how to proceed. Yeah, but <laughs> but I hold out hope that um, that something will be done in the future. Mm -hmm. um, Gary Perlman um, commented, uh, why did I choose this subject? So um, I chose this subject because um, I'm kind of interested in like the neurology field, um, like um, neurology, biology, um, and things like that. And also a family member of mine um, also has Alzheimer's. And it really sucked to find that out because when you're watching it happen, like to a close family member, it just like, it kind of like shocks you in a way. So like learning more about like the biological process uh, and how like it functions was really interesting because you're kind of getting two sides of like, the two sides like of a perspective, like you're getting like the real life thing in front of you and then how it's actually explained. So I think it was kind of more a personal and then like a general interest. Jasmine, could you just remind everybody what year you're going into in high school? Oh, um, I'm sorry. I don't know why I forgot it. Um, I'm a rising junior. Okay. Thanks. It's a good reminder. I appreciate it. Wonderful job, Jasmine. Really appreciate your research. Thank okay. You. And so next we are going to go on um, and spotlight Aaron Yu. Aaron is a sophomore in high school who currently serves as the Secretary of the Health Occupation Students of America. Erin plans to go to medical school to become a physician. She enjoys writing poems, swimming, and playing the flute. And uh, we'll go to Erin. Hello, can everybody see my screen? Hi everyone, I'm Erin, and today I'm gonna explore Tay-Sachs disease. And so Tay-Sachs, the very root of it is really in the deficiency of this enzyme called hexaaminidase, of, of and essentially it has a lot of implications in the metabolic and neurological pathways, which is like really um, interesting for a genetically caused um, disease. So today I'm going to cover the significance of Tay-Sachs as well as what kind of studies are being um, gone about to help ameliorate that issue. So Tay-Sachs is comprised of three main levels, um, three main lens to like um, kind of consider it. So the first lens is at the metabolical level. So Tay-Sachs is caused by a deficiency in the enzyme beta hexaaminidase A, and that causes a mutation in the hexagene and causes a lot of these buildups of gangliosides um, in both the central and peripheral nervous systems. So consummately, Tay-Sachs is caused um, because of the um, buildup of those fatty substances, um, gangliosides, in the GM2 pathway. So the pathway, um, the metabolic pathway goes from GM2 to GM3, but because of, of its inhibition, that's what causes Tay-Sachs. And many other kinds of um, meta of um, metabolic diseases are caused by inhibitions of these pathways, but Tay-Sachs is really unique because it's also caused by um, a genetic basis and um, Tay-Sachs has a lot of implications in the neurological scale because um, of its buildup in the central and peripheral nervous systems. So um, the second facet that is looking at through the genetic lens. So at the very smallest level, Tay-Sachs is caused by a change in the nucleotide of the exon of the exon eleven. So essentially, before it can be transcribed and be expressed um, correctly, um, Tay-Sachs is caused because that exon is kind of like spliced or isn't able to be expressed properly before it can actually be manifested in the central dogma of bio, which is from DNA, RNA to protein. So at the middle lens, which is um, at the chromosomal lens, Tay-Sachs is caused because of the mutation in chromosome 15, and that's where we see the enzyme hex A being encoded for. 
So um, completely zoomed out, we see Tay-Sachs um, occurring because it is a missense mutation, which is usually because of a insertion or frame shift. And so considering this genetic basis for Tay-Sachs, as well as its um, metabolically um, pathway inhibition, a lot of research has been going on to see how um, in sheep there is this gene called G444R, and scientists are seeing if a mutation in that gene might cause a role in this um, splicing of exon 11 before its proper expression in transcription, which might be the underlying bedrock of all of these implications um, in how it kind of develops as an inhibition of the metabolic pathway. So the third facet of Tay-Sachs um, is its neurological lens. So Tay-Sachs, its symptoms are usually manifested through um, degradations of neurons, um, not only the neurons in the um, central and peripheral nervous systems, but also you'll see it, um, the neurons in the eye, and that actually causes something called cherry red spots. As for those in the central and peripheral nervous systems, you'd really see a lot of seizures, um, muscle weakness, paralysis, not meeting um, milestones that are typical for that age. You'll also see um, hearing loss, deafness, and vision loss. And really, um, at its pinnacle, the reason why Tay-Sachs is such an important um, d disease to study is not only because of um, its many implications in different fields of bio, but also because Tay-Sachs um, starts to, to develop at a very young age, at about um, three to six months old. And this, um, is, this um, disease gets progressed gets progressively like worse as um, time goes on. So it's really important to kind of target it while um, Tay-Sachs um, like is first starting to develop in the child. So at its essence, Tay-Sachs is a metabolically caused disease. And um, hypothetically for Tay-Sachs to be cured, it would need to have the molecules, it would need to have um, the hex A enzyme to be able to travel to um, the brain, but because of the blood-brain barrier, um, that isn't possible, so that, that's why we don't see any guaranteed treatment plans, although there are some kind of plans to help alleviate those symptoms, and that include medication, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, as well as for chest therapies to help remove some excess mucus. You'll also see a lot of um, genetic counseling to see if um, parents who are carriers or have that disease might be um, might pass on to their offspring. And so, really considering these genetic and metabolic bases, we see a lot of studies in the inhibition of the GMT glycoside pathway as well as the G44R gene in sheep. Also, since um, because nerve cells, um, they uh, kind, kind of easily um, aren't able, able to reproduce as well as other cells like muscle cells, we also see a, a lot of um, neural stem cell studies in this field. And lastly, um, the current ongoing study is for AAV gene therapy. AAV is adeno-associated virus and is safe for humans. And it's a really good kind of vector for the study because it is in the capsid form and it's relatively small. So it is really convenient to like help travel and like by bypass those metabolic challenges of having the blood-brain barrier. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, good for you, Erin, for having such an uh, incredible understanding of a very complex subject. And just remind us, what grade are you going into? Um, 10th grade. 10th grade, yeah. Bravo, good for you. Um, I could really relate to this because I had genetic testing myself for, for TASAC. So do we have any questions? No. <laughs> First, kudos on... Uh on mastering a, a fairly complex, well, 
your colleagues have all mastered fairly complex topics, but uh, uh, this is this is certainly up there with them. Um, I was curious, did you see any, you know, one of the things that's that's a, a hot topic now for research is, is uh, gene therapy in utero. So before the, the child is born, based on prenatal testing, um, I don't know where Tay-Sachs might be with that. Did you, did you come across that in terms of trying, in other words, trying to fix the, the fetus before they're born? Right, and so for genetic um, counseling, um, they do kind of like go into like I believe like chorion villa sampling um, of like the embryo like but, um, in utero, but for Tay Sachs in particular, I don't think that many um, scientists have like for that for that area in particular of embryology, they haven't really found um, or they haven't found any say viable methods to kind of like help incorporate this because. Um, I think that um, they want to like first make sure that it's safe to like do um, this kind of um, genetics uh, testing because like because t sachs has like so many implications in like the genetic, metabolic, and neurological like areas of study. I think that it might involve more like more um, uh, more uh, aspects of testing than other kinds of diseases might have that are just really more pertaining to that one field of genetics um, in like per in, in particular and um, really I guess that um, because like many people have been saying that um, not only for like gene therapy but also like for CRISPR Cas9 and CRISPR Cas12 how it's kind of like important to like help um, not help but kind of like uh utilize that technology utilize that technology um in you in utero because um there's like so many cells that like to edit to edit and like each cell like has like so much D D dna like inside of it so um for crispr in particular um for, for that like because like humans have a really, a really long like gen generational um lifespan like it, about like 20 years it's been like kind of hard to find these clinical studies um be, be, uh, it, because um even though CRISPR was like like founded in like 2000 um like in the in the, in the early 2010s um a lot of clinical studies are like still going on because it's really hard to kind of encapsulate so many um like uh, like be because um uh humans have a really long generational uh, a, a really long generational lifespan and so like just testing it would take a long time and moreover not just like for like one generation but also kind of like for like several gen generations just to, to see if like um that same um thing that like that this some kind of um, problem wasn't manifested before, but like kind of, kind of like shows up in like future generations, kind of like recessively, and so I think that that might um be a facsimile of a situation. Um, it, it might um have parallels drawn to it, and like how um similarly for taste sacks, um because it has so many implications in different kind of um fields that aren't really just pertaining or just um limited to genetics, it might require more testing for scientists to like truly be able to like safely test it, like um through like um for example Corian Villa sampling or et cetera in Euro. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Great. Okay, good. Thank you. So you have okay. you have a good sense of uh of yeah. genetic sequencing and, and where this is all going. I mean this is the future of medicine. So Yeah. Great. So, okay. Very, very good work. Thank you. Yeah, and we're going to see Aaron again just a second to conclude our presentations for this afternoon. We have a group project. Uh, you already got a chance to meet Jasmine and Aaron. Um, Jasmine, to remind you, is interested in a career in biology. Aaron plans to go to medical school. And then we have Neha who is a rising senior at um, Middle College and she's interested in software engineering. She enjoys reading, hiking and swimming. And to complete the team, there's Melissa. She participated in a team project. She's not able to make it today, 
but she is also interested in neurology. So with that, um, I'll let the team go ahead. Okay, um, I'll share my screen. Sorry, let me just go. Um, um, let me try that again. Okay. Um, so uh, our project was based on genome editing, um, um, a CRISPR-Cas9 overview by Aaron Yu, Nihal Lamataman, Jasmine Flores, and Melissa Hernandez. Next slide. Um, here's a historical lens of CRISPR. CRISPR first detected in E. coli in 1987. Yoshizumi Ishino, a Japanese scientist, and his unit detected CRISPR in E. coli. They accidentally cloned an irregular series of repeated sequences unified with spacer sequences when observing a gene responsible for conversion of alkaline phosphate. Due to the time of the discovery, it was deemed impossible to determine the biological functions of these sequences due to a lack of sufficient DNA sequence data. In 1993, um, there was a discovery of CRISPR and uh, M. tuberculosis. A group of researchers led by J.D. van Embedden in the Netherlands made a discovery between different strains of M. tuberculosis and characterized M. tuberculosis using a technique known as um, spalagiotyping. This led to a, a variety of these sequences being found in other bacteria and archaeal genomes. Francisco Mojica and Rich Jensen were the first scientists to call these repeats CRISPRs. Um, in 2000, um, there was a research for CRISPR adaptive immune response. Originally, when first identified, CRISPRs were first thought uh, were thought to be a novel DNA repair tool in the thermophilic archaea and bacteria. However, Francisco and Mojica, Mojica and his team took notice of these spacer sequences and how similar they look to sequences in the bacteriophages, viruses, and plasmids. Subsequently, they discovered that viruses are not able to infect bacteria harboring homologous spacer sequences, which implied that these sequences might contribute in adaptive immune response systems in prokaryotes. In 2012, um, CRISPR was being used for genome editing. A group of four, George Church, Jennifer Didna, uh, Emmanuel Charpenter, and Feng Zheng, um, discovered that by designing guide RNA to target a precise location in the genome, CRISPR can be used to modify the genome. Next slide. So this gene editing technology involves two essential components for its applications, a guide RNA and Cas9. The first part of the complex, Cas9, which is, a, is an endonucleus that essentially cuts up the DNA, allowing modifications to be made to the genome. The second part is the guide RNA sequence, which directs Cas9 to a specific location in the DNA where the edit should be made. By fusing these two components together, CRISPR-Cas9 is able to edit parts of an organism's genome by removing, adding, or even altering sections of the DNA strand. The process begins with the Cas9 RNA complex searching through segments of DNA for its target site. Cas9 unwinds a section of DNA and verifies if the guide RNA sequence matches. If the sequence is paired completely, Cas9 cuts the DNA, forming a double-stranded break. After this, three main categories of genetic edits can be performed. One, the break in our DNA causes our cells to naturally respond by activating DNA repair pathways called non-homologous and joining. This process may lead to the additional deletion of a few base pairs, which disrupts the original DNA sequence and can cause the gene to be disabled. Two, a larger piece of DNA can be deleted by targeting independent sites on either side of the targeted deletion with two different guide RNAs. The repair process joins the separate ends, deleting the intervening or middle sequence. And three, corrections can also be made to the DNA by adding a third component to the Cas9 RNA complex called the repair template. This DNA template is designed with sequences that match the DNA adjacent to the target cut site. Through a process called Homology directed repair, the cell uses the template to repair the break, thereby replacing the faulty DNA sequence or even inserting a new gene sequence. Let's now delve into the ethical considerations of CRISPR. So in this study in 2018, when CRISPR was first used to edit the genome of two twins, this started a very heated debate on the ethical um, implications. And that can be divided into three key facets. So the first facet is really how it can um, deepen the gap of socioeconomic disparity. Um, if um, both status can affect 
the, the accessibility of such a novel and not yet um, widely used um, biotech as CRISPR. And so many people are concerned that um, tech such as designer babies might um, cause people of different socioeconomic classes to have different access to um, these of um, uh, ability enhanced um, genes, like for example, high IQ, um, athletic ability, and etc. And so besides that, CRISPR is also taken into consideration because of um, if a person's genome is widely accessible, then that could cause an onslaught of, of, of discrimination of people who don't have um, a quote unquote perfect genes and that's really defined as if like that person is liable to um, different kinds of diseases um, and other kind of liabilities. And so that really compromises the HIPAA data, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And it and it's it's discrimination isn't um, really only for things like jobs, but also for housing as well. And so it's starting to take for a, a, it's, it's starting to take um kind of a bigger role in the real world besides just um um in, in uh, besides just enhancing some kind of traits like in designer babies and moreover that kind of ties into um along the similar lines of how really if a genome is that accessible then how the person's consent um kind of like how long that can like um be taken into account for example if somebody was involved in two unrelated cases if that can be tracked forensically at a crime scene and so really um all, all in all this kind of encapsulates these kind of dystopian um novels um for example brave new world and barco tattoo and so um crispr um to kind of create these um, in enhancements in ability. You can see it at three um, zoomed in levels of the nucleotide, chromosomal, and genomic levels. Next slide, please. So CRISPR, um, as of now, CRISPR really benefits um, those who have um, genetic diseases that are like because of point mutations. And so point mutations, they are mutations caused by a change in one single nucleotide, and it's it's more um, convenient for CRISPR to target these um, in particular um, as of now, because that means that they're, so essentially if one, so if each cell has the same DNA, but just um, not all turned on because of differentiation, but if they all have um, the same DNA and there's so many cells in the human body, then it's pretty difficult to make so many changes. That's why point mutations, um, those are ones that are most hard, that are most targeted. And some of the, the more common ones um, that are also point mutations are cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia. And sickle cell anemia. And so for um, cystic fibrosis, you see um, CRISPR targeted in the CFTR gene, and for sickle cell anemia, you see it targeted in the HBB gene. And so here you can see CRISPR-Cas9 in the context of a neuron, and really all of this can be taken into context. Um, so in this TED Talk in 2013, um, one of the co-founders of CRISPR talked about how CRISPR is kind of like that grammar um, feature you see on like Word documents. So it's kind of like that, how it's more um, kind of kind of easier like at this point in time to target these uses like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell of point um, mutations. Next slide, please. So um, from all of this, there are future implications. Um, CRISPR, uh, Cas9 is still a recent discovery within the biological field and the beginning of clinical trials with CRISPR Cas9 are in progress. Scientists have been seeking ways to widen their range of approaches to improve the safety and adequacy of these trials. Additionally, in the future, we may see CRISPR Cas9 technology used to improve the research in crop studies. And some potential eradications that are being worked with CRISPR Cas9 right now are cancer, blood disorders, blindness, AIDS, HIV infections, cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, Huntington's disease, and COVID-19. And to the right are the um, discoveries of um, Cas9. Uh, here are our work cited. Um, thank you for listening to our presentation.
No, it's really fascinating. Um, I were running a little late and I want to, in all respect to the judge's time, uh, maybe we can take one question if there's, go ahead, Dave. Uh, I'll ask, uh, well, this is this was a Nobel Prize winner, by the way. You probably know that, right? They, the two founders, yeah, they, they won the Nobel Prize. What I what impressed, well, this is very complex stuff again, and and but it really is the future of medicine. And we talk about fixing babies before they're born. This is this is what we're talking about. But I wanted to ask you how you. I was um, impressed by the fact that you explored some of the ethical dilemmas raised by this this technology. I was wondering how you what opened your eyes to that particular side of the question. Um, I'm going to suggest that we let each person answer that with just two to three sentences, because we're again, we have very little time. Um, Jasmine, did you want to go first? Um, so I would say, I feel like I already said um, a lot of sentences. Um, this is Aaron's side of the project. So I feel like giving Aaron more time to explain that would probably be better than me just explaining it. Okay, that's very gracious of you. Um, Niha, did you have thoughts on the ethical implications? Um, I 100% agree. It was Erin who suggested this topic to us, and then we we all loved it. And we, um, so I believe that she knows more about it, and because she's been researching it for a long time independently as well, outside of this project. Great. Okay, Erin, you've got maximum three sentences. Count them. I think that CRISPR is kind of pivotal because as for the ethical considerations, there's also been some studies in um, how malaria, how the, the mosquito vector of malaria, like how CRISPR can actually like wipe out that entire species as well. So I get it's really a matter of not only how it affects life and enhances life's so like genetic traits, but also like how it can also impact like a species like um, uh, evolutionary fitness and how that all kind of ties in together in the context of life. And so, um, in the context of designer babies, um, I do feel that um, the accessibility of CRISPR because it is such like it, it was only discovered about ten years ago, so it still does have. A, a lot of clinical trials and still in pro progress. So definitely um, considering that, I think that CRISPR um, has a lot of future implications and will continue to kind of like highlight that like connection be between um, life and how like death, how that can all kind of tie together in the um, lens of life really. Okay, great, thank you. Um, well, um, uh, congratulations to all of our students. Uh, everybody we've had today is uh, in high school or uh, one student just graduated high school. Um, thank you for our uh, guests who took the time to support our students this afternoon. Thank you to our judges. Um, couldn't do it without you um, evaluating the student projects. And with that in mind, uh, if you'd like, you can leave the room. Uh, button should be button on your blue button on your lower right. And if uh, you like, Lindsay and I will stay on for just a couple of minutes if anybody has any uh, procedural questions. Can Thank you say, again, everybody. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to say how impressed. <laughs> These are phenomenally complex topics. And uh, believe me, there are many, many people, physicians, practicing physicians and, and researchers and stuff who, who can't get their heads around this stuff. And uh, I just was so impressed by, uh, by the level of work and thought and comprehension of this really complex stuff. This is, yeah. this is, I wish you all very much luck in the future. Thank you. And to our students, that's coming from a man who has spent his uh, his lifelong work is as a physician. So 